Second. Good evening. It is uh, 6 p.m. and today is Thursday, March 12th, and this is the Olentangy Local Schools Board of Education uh, business session. I'd like to call the meeting to order. Mr. Kern, please call the roll. Mr. Bartz. Here. Mrs. Fiesel. Here. Mr. King. Here. Mr. White. I don't see him, so I think he's here. Any word? Or? No word. Okay. No word. Mr. O'Brien. I'm here. Uh, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, the uh, first item is to approve the agenda, which I believe there was uh, an addendum to the agenda provided ahead of time. Yes. We need to amend the addendum. Can you scratch that thing out? Y yes, we do, actually. Uh, in, in your addendum, I believe uh, you have uh, additions to uh, items A, certified staff, which we will keep. Item B, classified staff. We have a couple of resignations. But item H, approve the contract with the uh, Metropolitan Educational Technology Association. You need more information on that, so we will bring that back in April. So we will not be approving that this evening. So we'll pull that item? Yes. Okay. So I'll entertain a motion to approve the agenda as addended and amended. There you go. Very so good. moved. Yes, thank you. Go ahead. Second. Any discussion on the agenda? No? Seeing none, please call the roll. Mrs. Fiesel? Yes. Mr. King? Yes. Mr. Bartz? Yes. Mr. O'Brien? Yes. Um, so the first step is our presentation. This is the Liberty Tree Elementary Roots Ambassadors. So I'd like to call up Terry Kim, the principal. Thank you for coming tonight. Oh, thank you. Um, this evening, you're going to hear from our Roots Ambassadors and um, Mindy Skinner, Aaron Booty. Christine Fisher, Christina Fisher, and Sarah Taylor have all been a part, as well as Rachel Weber, um, have been the facilitators of this group. And I'm going to let Aaron go ahead and take over and tell you a little bit more about the program and the great work that the Liberty Tree Kids have done this year. Hello there. I am Aaron Budick. I am a second grade teacher at Liberty Tree Elementary. Um, I'm here tonight with my colleagues, like Mrs. Kate said, Minnie Skinner, Christina Fisher, Rachel Weber, Philly Williamson, and Sarah Jane. Um, we are advisors to a service learning group in our school, and it's called Roots Ambassadors. You're getting a little pamphlet from us right now, kind of showcase to you what, what we do. I am a video kind of girl, but I thought this could be something you could hold on to and keep a hold of. Um, this group is made up of Liberty Tree fourth and fifth graders, and it meets twice a month before school starts. Um, there's no monetary cost to join this group. The only requirement is to have a heart to serve and make the world a better place. Um, we average 100 students each meeting. Each month, we also offer a Saturday service learning opportunity. These service projects have taken us around the Central Ohio area, helping those in need. We've traveled to the inner city of Columbus to serve a hot meal to a women's homeless shelter, through a winter storm to host a Valentine's Day party to a Delaware nursing home, throughout Delaware County raking leaves for the elderly, and so much more. One of the things I enjoy the most being a part of this group is to see the excitement, eagerness, and empathy develop in the kids as they pay it forward. It is our hope as Roots Advisors that the lessons the students are learning um, by being a part of this group will remain with them for their entire life. We have brought with us three people who will speak to you about our service club. The first speakers you will hear from are two current Roots Ambassadors. Their names are Lauren and Lily. Our next speaker is Jim Burton. Jim's son, Ben, is a fifth grader at um, fifth grade Roots Ambassador. Our Liberty Tree Building Principal, Mrs. Caton, will wrap our presentation up with a final remark. I just want to thank you for allowing us to come and share with you all the wonderful things that our students are doing at Liberty Tree. Hi, my name is Lauren Rudak, and I'm a fourth grader at Liberty Tree Elementary. And I'm here to tell you about Roots. 
I've learned and experienced so much from Roots. Being a Roots ambassador has changed my way of thinking. I have interacted with so many people to, who have helped me to pay it forward, and this has made a gigantic difference in my life. Each Friday when I walk into Miss Fisher's room, everybody has smiles on their faces. We are all eager to help someone new. Helping out other people makes me feel so good inside. I love how Roots Ambassadors are willing to come together and do such exciting things. We all work together as a team to get things done, like when we had a goal of 100 homemade Valentine's Day cards, and we did more than that. Miss Budick is such an energetic person who wants to make a better world. She comes up with the greatest plans to accomplish that. When guest speakers come and they speak about things that you did, I hope that someday I could do what they did. I get so inspired by the guest speakers, and so do a hundred other fourth and fifth graders. It's a good feeling knowing that someday, Roots Ambassadors will change the world. Hi, my name is Lily Walter, and I'm a fourth grader at Liberty Tree Elementary, and I'm here to tell you about Roots. I learned so much by being a Roots Ambassador. I learned a lot about helping people in so many ways. I learned that there are millions of people homeless and in poverty, but I also learned that there are a million ways to change that. For example, I would serve food to people at the Common Ground Free Store. Just seeing the smile on the people's faces at the free store when I did something nice made me feel that I could change the way they live for the better. I have made some changes in my own life since I started Roots. I am more understanding and more outgoing with the less fortunate. I now understand that one dollar makes it, could make a huge difference in someone's life. Instead of using the dollar to buy a pack of gum or a pack of crayons, I'd rather get someone a hot burrito at a gas station. My heart breaks when I see really worthy, ordinary kids and families thrown out of their homes just because they don't have the money that we have. Roots has changed me from the inside out. I love Roots because it feels good knowing that 9, 10, 11, and 12 year olds can change the world. It also feels good that 100 plus people in 4th and 5th grade want to be involved in changing people's lives. I love being a part of a great organization where the main goal is to make the world a better place. I would also like to recognize the Roots Advisors for being awesome role models. We are very fortunate for the time and energy they bring into our meetings. Good evening, uh, my name is Jim Burton, and uh, I am Ben Burton's dad. Ben, can you stand up? <laughs> you're, the, you're the one that got me into this. So. <laughs> Uh, and as Mrs. Burick said, he's a, a fifth grader at Liberty Tree. I have uh, participated in three different Roots uh, events. I helped uh, Rick lose this uh, fall. That was a lot of fun. Uh, the the uh, car wash earlier in the spring. And the one that I, I really got fired up about was uh, this winter at the Arbors, which is an assisted living facility in Delaware. And as Mrs. Blake said, yes, it was storming. It was a nice winter storm that day. And I guess I'm just like any other uh, male my age. I had a probably three or four dozen other things I'd rather have been doing <laughs> than going, but I did. And it, it made a big difference with me as well as with the residents there. We get there, uh, it's a Valentine's party. We're playing bingo. Uh, Mrs. Blake and her team are doing Tiaras on the, uh, the ladies' heads, just having a lot of fun. I, uh, it took me a little while to warm up, and I saw a couple of other the dads making the effort, and that's the, that's the theme here, making the effort to talk to folks. Next thing you know, uh, it's over, and I find myself walking two ladies back to their room. They are roommates and best buddies, uh, Martha Bell, and Amy, I got a picture, uh, it might even be in there. <laughs> Next thing you know, it's 45 minutes after the, after the event is over, and I'm still in there with Ben, we're helping them put together a puzzle, we're learning more about their families. Uh, it, it, was, it was something that I will never forget and will continue to spur me into more activities with the Roots group, uh, with the bottom line being, take the time because it means a ton to them. What little amount you can give 
means a ton to them, and I'll, I'll never forget that. Thank you. Thank you. I would like my uh, staff members, if they would please come up here, please. Misty, and Sarah, and Billy, and Sarah. <laughs> And this is my second family. I am so proud of them. <laughs> Dr. Lucas, um, you've meant a lot to this building. And I'm going to tear up. I, I, I'm, it's, you've been very much part of us and support of us. And um, we wanted to congratulate you on your retirement. And so John Jurevich has uh, painted a gift for you. John, if you would present him to this, please. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, obviously, we're Liberty Tree, and you will always be part of our roots, Dr. Lucas. Um, each of the leaves it represents one of the buildings, the 25 buildings in this district. Um, but we can't thank you enough for the support you have always given us and the district, and um, you mean a lot to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Shake all of your hands, by the way, <laughs> <laughs> if you don't mind. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, Dr. Lucas is shaking hands. Does anyone have any questions for the group? I, I had a question for Lauren and Lily. Lauren and Lily, come on up. <laughs> I, want, I wanted to know from each of you, which um, volunteer opportunity did you enjoy doing the most and why? Well, I really liked... Um, just going to the meetings because they were really fun and each time we'd do something new and someone would come in and maybe speak to us and like it's really interesting to find out what you can help and yeah. do to help. My favorite was definitely the Common Ground Free Store. Oh, yeah. We had a lot of fun mm -hmm. and I just remember the guy who was sitting against the wall and he had like four Oreo donuts, like three pieces of cake, um, maybe like four meatball subs, and, um, and some salad. And it was just so sad because I would eat like probably one third of that and probably waste like half of it. But it meant so much to him that they were giving him this food and, um, then there was one lady, and she was just kind of, she didn't really like kids, <laughs> but I got her to warm up. Oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> I don't have a question, but a comment. I do think that the two young ladies were probably two of the best speakers we've oh had. Oh, my gosh, yes. yes. I Thank you to the staff for what you're doing. Thank you to volunteers. It's terrific. Yes, and great program. Great stuff. Thanks for spending your evening great with job. us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> as, as we tell everyone, you're welcome to stay. You're also free to go. <laughs> <laughs> it is sunny out. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, the uh, next uh, end item is the uh, board president's report, which she usually does clear the room. <laughs> I've just got uh, two two items. So one, uh, I want to take a minute to uh, recognize Ms. Wagner Fiesel. Last night at the um, OSBA Central um, Central Committee yeah. um, Spring Spring Conference, Spring yeah. Conference. Yeah. Um, Julie was recognized for 10 years of service. Yeah. Uh, to the Old Tangy School Board. I'm glad so you're having fun. Good job. 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 The, the next uh, and agenda item, uh, I want to have a discussion about the um, superintendent search proposal. So everyone um, should have received and was posted to the board um, uh, account, uh, first class account. We're going to end up with four proposals, mm -hmm. like finding leaders, the ESC, K-12 and OSBA, mm -hmm. and I think as we um, talked about, we'd like to invite um, two back, 
So I'd like to maybe uh, have some discussion on which two we'd like to invite back. Yeah. Um, but before we get into that discussion, okay. I just had a question uh, for yep. Mr. O'Brien. Um, do we know if Mr. Wright is going to participate? Because um, according to the Ohio Revised Code 3319.01, that outlines um, not only what a superintendent does, but the board's role in hiring a superintendent and going through the evaluation process. It's been my experience that he hasn't been participating in the evaluation experience. Um, he didn't participate in the hiring of a treasurer. He didn't participate in the appointment of a new school board member. So I was wondering if you knew if he's even going to participate in the most important job that we have as board members, and that's the hiring of a superintendent. Yeah, so I, I'd say, unfortunately, I wish I knew the answer. Um, I left Mr. White a voicemail on Tuesday, I believe, asking him that question. Well, actually, two questions. One, if he was coming tonight, and then two, if he was going to participate in the search process. And uh, I have not heard uh, any response or acknowledgement uh, to my voicemail. So while I agree it's frustrating than his lack of participation, at this point, I don't know uh, what his plan of action is. Uh, in terms of participation. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, okay, so, and maybe just to back up a minute, I had reached out to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven firms um, to request proposals to be submitted. So four have been submitted. And again, we'd like to kind of go down to uh, one or two to come back um, for a special meeting. I believe we set it for March 25th. Mm -hmm. um, which would be, uh, we'll have it here, uh, brief interview, discussion, and ultimately selection uh, of the search firm. So with that, I'd open up to anyone's thoughts on which two you'd like to move forward. Go ahead. Um, I have made notes on all of them. Yep. Um, my experience with the Ohio School Boards Association um, through the, the treasurer um, search, um, I was really impressed with the how they handled that search for us. I had mm -hmm. never used them before for um, a search. Um, so I, I would like to, I guess I, I would say that that's my preference. If I had to give you a preference of one of the companies that I would be interested in and coming okay. back to talk to them more about um, how they do their superintendent search. Um, I'm familiar with the Education Service Center because that's who we used in a, a prior search when we were searching for a superintendent before. I thought that um, the K-12 group, though, that was interesting. It had um, different ideas, and I wasn't as familiar with them as I am with the ESC and the Ohio School Boards Association. Um, so if I had to give you a ranking yeah. um, of the top two, I, I'm just interested in learning more from K-12. Okay. Um, and the Ohio School Boards Association. Let's go around the table. Um, so yeah, in my evaluation too, I did a ranking and um, I was looking, I guess, for four things, having not been through this process before, but just being experienced with proposals and project management. So I was really looking at the experience level of the firms that they demonstrated in their proposals, um, the quality of the proposal itself, uh, their process outline, and how they were going to support the process to find uh, the best candidates to bring to us and uh, put costs way at the end. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's something we need to be concerned about, but at the end of the day, you know, we're hiring a, a CEO to manage a, a very large entity with lots of moving parts. So, uh, so my ranking came down as I looked at pros and cons and some areas of concern. Uh, for my top two were um, uh, ESC and uh, OSBA. Okay. Um, I thought the other ones, uh, I think there was some, I think that was a dividing line for me. I think the other two, um, there were some concerns I had with either the depth and in, in another case, uh, something else that just didn't seem right to me. So. Okay. okay. Again, we're going through the rankings. I was also looking at who the individuals would be assigned to the lead person from the consulting firm. Mm -hmm. And having uh, some knowledge about a couple of the people, I sort of tied with OSBA and ESC um, for the, if we're going to do two to bring them back, and then and then it would have been um, 
for me, it would have been uh, uh, finding leaders and then uh, and then K-12. There were some aspects about the K-12, understanding what you said about mm -hmm. learning more about it, that it just seemed to be a little burdensome to me and just a lot more information than I really needed to see. And then they broke it down into three different levels of service, and I thought they just confused the issue more than just getting right at the heart of it. So that, that disturbed me somewhat. But again, for me, it was, especially with ESC, it was the person who they would bring forward as, the, uh, as their lead. So that's the two that I was looking at. Okay. And if, um, so similarly, uh, we did have a good experience with OSBA in the treasure search, which I, um, I thought was well done. So I ranked uh, OSBA as my top choice. And then um, I did actually have finding leaders as my second choice. Um, and just, I guess for context, all the prices were relatively consistent. There was not a big span of differential in price, anything from basically $4,500 to 17500 depending upon the depth of the search and the um, services provided. So, you know, for hiring a, in essence, the some of you run a $160 million school district with 1,000 employees, a differential in cost of, you know, $10,000, I think. In essence, all the proposals were a push on cost, and it comes probably down to the consultant that's going to serve us mm -hmm. and, um, you know, in the network of the organization to make sure that they can build a sufficient breadth and depth of a candidate pool. Um, so, yeah, I ranked OSBA in, uh, in finding leaders. So, so clearly OSBA, because all four of us had OSBA in the top two, and the next ESC had the next with two votes. So I propose we'd go ahead and move and have OSBA and invite uh, OSBA and ESC in uh, for interviews on the 25th. Mm -hmm. Does everyone go over that? I don't yeah, have any objection. I, I just have one other question. So does do I just remember mostly for probably you three being more experienced? Yeah. Um, Mr. McVeigh, the person who's identified for ESC, do you know him? I I actually do know him. Um, not from a superintendent's position. He used to live across the street from my parents. Okay. <laughs> so that's how, that's how I, and nothing against Dale by any means. Um, so, I, but I, you asked the question and I'm honest yeah, with I was you, just, and uh, so. I guess I was thinking, taking from yeah. the standpoint of, uh, I mean, he, I, yeah, I, similar demographics, similar size right. districts, similar size issues, um, uh, just someone that, that, that yeah, absolutely, thank you. That was a much simpler word than right. <laughs> Kudos to Mr. King. Right. So in terms of the format on the 25th, what I would propose, I said, would be two things. One, to avoid, frankly, the firm just coming in and, and recanting their proposal. Mm -hmm. um, Roger came up with an idea of we, uh, if the board members would submit some questions to me, I'll compile a list of questions that we would actually provide to the um, firms ahead of time mm -hmm. so that way they knew what we were expecting of them and what topics and issues uh, we wanted them to cover. And that way we could make the most use of the, right. say, roughly, I would assume 30 minutes a piece yeah, with a 15-minute break in between. Mm -hmm. And um, we can be able to, to really direct their efforts and get get the most out of that time uh, with those firms. I'd rather take the time to ask questions and mm -hmm. get some feedback. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, then listen to a dog and pony show. Exactly. Yeah. And, and it's the proposal that we already just read. The proposals, in some respects, there was a commonality. For instance, I'll just mention uh, brochure. You right. Know, I just think there's certain things, or, or here's a, even, there's another good example about scheduling the interviews and right. the logistics behind that. Well, that was done in the house by Terry, Mrs. Niehaus, here. And there's certain things that I think, I mean, I did a chart of things. I think, here's what the district should do, can do. Here's what the consultant I look to. And I want to get their feedback from that. Sure. Because obviously it changes their scope. Right. Yeah, it does. Yeah. <coughs> okay. okay, so I'll make, uh, I'll make the calls tomorrow to the ESC and the OSBA, mm -hmm. and get that scheduled for the 25th. If you could submit some questions to me, I'll compile and get the list back out to this group. Sounds good. And we'll be ready for the 25th. Good. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'll continue to uh, see if Mr. Wright is going to choose to participate. If nothing else, maybe we should send him something certified mail. So Because uh, he hasn't been checking his email. Either. Okay. That's it for the uh, president's report. Can we get the uh, superintendent's report? We're ready. Thank you. Yeah.
feel like everyone one left. We're all sitting in the back. All right. Good to see everyone. Um, what a great presentation that was. And, and I'm, I'm talking, obviously, I'm very appreciative of the staff, but uh, what those kids are learning at the age that they're learning mm -hmm. will benefit them, obviously, for the rest of their lives. And, uh, you know, that, that staff is very special. But Erin uh, Budick, uh, you know, she always makes me get on the video. Uh, <laughs> I have to always sing a part of a song or do something goofy. And uh, first year I was here, I was like, I'm not really, I don't know if I should do that. but. You know, once you go over there, she's always into something. I know, uh, you know, whether it's blood drives or videos or whatever that may be, and that's a very active building, and you can see that staff just kind of flow right through those students, and they're very upbeat and positive, and, and we're very appreciative of everything that they do. Uh, Terry runs a very, very good building, nice building. Uh, over uh, good things, we have several, obviously, th uh, and, and with the Days coming down from the winter and the winter sports season coming to an end. We have a lot of things and, and hopefully we stay up to the moment and we don't leave anything out because uh, a district this size, obviously, you're always afraid of that. But Indian Springs Elementary, you're going to see, you know, you heard, you heard the kids from Liberty Tree talking about paying it forward. Indian Springs Elementary had a dance-a-thon raised $16,507 for the American Cancer Society, you won't see that theme the rest of the school year, because you know the kids are uh, our kids and our staff just are very much in 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 uh, favor of volunteerism and giving back, and it's just incredible the things that we do and the amount of money that we raise uh, for different causes. So we're very proud of the individuals at Indian Springs, um, Liberty High School Deca. Uh, usually, uh, Mike has. Uh, uh, a lot of um, wounded warrior project is, you know, it gets a lot of publicity for that. But as you can see, I think it's roughly sixteen thousand dollars up there. If you go down through, you have Ross Heart Hospital, the American Heart Association, and of course, again, the wounded warrior project and, and the honor flight. And, and uh, those of you that have been uh, here for a while, you know we've talked about that whole uh, wounded warrior and honor flight project from the Liberty High School Deca, and, and uh, very proud of the things that they do. Uh, as we are with all three of our high school DECA programs. Uh, Liberty High School junior Cameron Thatcher, state diving champ, set the state uh, state tournament and pool records. Um, first Orantangy writing contest coming up, submissions date due April 17th. Uh, and this one got on here late, but we got it on here. Orange High School boys bowling team qualified for the state tournament. I believe that's the first yep. bowling team yep. that qualified for the state tournament. So we're very proud of uh, those individuals and, and wishing wishing them luck. Um, again, uh, we, we had a, a very, very good winter season uh, from our, our athletes and, and the spring's coming up, and I know that's going to be just as successful. Um, I see Brad Sprague back there, so I'm not going to steal his thunder, but Brad, thank you. I've worked with you. I, I remember I was in this district for uh, two months, maybe, three months, and you took me to uh, Chicago, right? Yes, sir. We are very, very fortunate in this district to have, have Brad Sprague, not only as a parent, but also as a consultant and an individual that kind of takes us through these uh, bond sales. So he's going to give us a short report on our recent uh, refunding bond sale. Uh, Mr. Rafe and Mr. Fetty will be talking about the academic interventions. I think we started this a couple of years ago uh, where we, we talk about the specific things we do for our students in regard to testing and intervention. So I'm, um, uh, again, looking forward to that report. And Mr. Marsh will be up here, uh, retire, rehouse. Uh, we have to have that public hearing. Uh, he'll talk a little bit about that. I believe there are three individuals uh, on the agenda in regard to that discussion. Total, I think we have uh, six teachers, one administrators. And again, I'll let Mr. Marsh talk about the savings that the district uh, uh, gets to witness uh, throughout this retire, rehire process. We have a, a new food service. Uh, supervisor on the agenda, Bethany Limco, I believe, is uh, on the agenda. Administrative contract renewals, where we have 15, 16 administrative contracts, mostly on three year contracts. College Credit Plus Partnership. Um, 
You've been through this one also. I believe I, three years ago we had David Harrison here, the president of Columbus State. Uh, and at that time we were in a dual enrollment and we were trying to uh, uh, come to some type of an agreement and a compact in Central Ohio and it got, we got it down to $25 a credit hour and then College Credit Plus came along. And basically what it says was, uh, you know, you will provide uh, dual enrollment opportunities for all kids, but you also pay for it. So what we did was we, uh, we got the ESC to kind of uh, get the Central Ohio Consortium together and negotiate on our behalf uh, for all districts in Central Ohio. So it basically comes down to $40 per credit hour across the board. And that's what you were, uh, we're asking for approval on tonight. That's that College Credit Plus partnership um, that uh, I want to say close to 40 school districts are involved in that. Uh, but uh, I will check specifically if you want to know the specifics of those numbers. Arrowhead Elementary roof, we are uh, replacing that. I think uh, it was not the, uh, as you saw in this, on the memo, it was not the next one up, but it was very close. And of course, we're in that time now where we're having buildings that are in the 15 to 20 year age. and. That's part of that whole process of going through and kind of keeping those buildings up to date. So we were asking for approval to address that elementary roof, I believe, at a cost of around $277,000. Uh, last but not least, you have retirements and we'll continue to have retirements. I do want to mention one person, Barb Winslow, uh, is on the agenda. She's been uh, with us for 27 years, uh, Heritage Elementary. Uh, she's up for retirement and uh, on the agenda for approval to uh, approve that retirement and we wish her all the luck in the world and thank her for all of her service that she's given to the Old Tangy Local School District. Important dates, just a reminder, we went over these last meeting, just another reminder of OEF Spirit of Old Tangy, Saturday, March 21st. I want to say that group uh, raised fifty thousand dollars last year on that uh, activity. It's, it was very well attended, and uh, that's one of those uh, spring springtime activities where we get everyone together, and it's always good to see all of the Olentangy uh, supporters at this event. So all, everyone's invited. Uh, we have a joint meeting of the um, business advisory council and the uh, advocacy committee. Uh, it's Mar Monday, March 23rd. Actually, that's that's very very soon, right? Mm -hmm. uh, 6:30 p.m. CTR. That's that way. Yep. Here, right here in this building. Um, we've had some things going on from a legislative standpoint that uh, uh, some good things taking place, and we're going to share that. That's kind of a teaser of that meeting. Uh, get those two groups together and share, uh, give you an up-to-date version of where we are. As you know, the budget was released in January. I'm thinking April is when it's going to come out of the House into the Senate, and probably May to June is, is when it's going to be back on the governor's desk for, for a signature. Uh, so we have a lot of work to do, and we're making great headway. Uh, but we need to continue to push that, uh, that minimum funding piece. That's the piece that we are pushing. Um, and uh, we're going to get those two groups together on Monday, March 23rd, to have that conversation. And as Mr. O'Brien already uh, talked about and the entire board had a great discussion on, we have a special board meeting on Wednesday, March 25th, right here at 6 o'clock. That will be all I have for this evening, unless you have any questions. Could, could I just add to your OEF announcement? For Absolutely. Absolutely. There will be a large green TV for March Madness. Oh, for yeah. Games, okay. We will have the basketball game on. Or multiple games. That'll help. Actually, there will be multiple games. Yeah. Multiple games. Absolutely. Because the Columbus games are Friday, Sunday, so they won't be in town. They'll be out of town games. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so if you have tickets, you don't have an excuse. Right. You can be there. Correct. <laughs> Very good point. Anything else? Anything else? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lucas. Mr. Kern, Treasurer's Report? Yeah, as on the same means uh, for Treasurer Action Items, we have three items. Uh, approve the minutes for February 18th, um, approve some amended appropriations, and approve some donations. Uh, donations this evening uh, range from uh, 
two from uh, one from Liberty and one from Orange High School for some boys assistant lacrosse coaches. And we also have from Wyandot PTO some smart board bulbs, classroom supplies, red ribbon week and donation, and some three Remo. To, um, I apologize if I butcher this. Tugano drums, uh, about five hundred dollars from Cider Ridge PTO to the elementary school. So I'm not sure what those are, but nice to know. But, um, also this evening, uh, uh, Dr. Lucas mentioned Brad Sprague. Uh, uh, be here talking about uh, the bond sale we're here shortly um, it was very successful he'll get into some of the numbers and stuff in the process um, we did maintain our bond rating which is one of our CIP goals um, so that's a good thing we did push for an upgrade I don't know if Brad will touch upon it a little bit but uh, I think Moody's was close um, but you know there's certain you know their discussion items we just didn't quite get there but we feel strong with our with second second highest rating so uh, we feel good about that process. So, uh, and third uh, announcement: uh, April 13th at 6:30 in this room uh, will be the uh, Finance and Audit Committee meeting. Um, we will review our uh, assumptions and uh, for the five-year forecast, which the board will hear the first reading. I know our board meetings kind of got moved around. We hear two meetings usually in May, um, but you have the first reading then on April 30th. And then uh, for, we'll be back for approval on May 14th for the five-year forecast. So the, the 13th is Audit Finance Committee? Yes, April 13th is a Monday at 6.30 uh, in this room for the Audit Finance Committee. Okay. I have a question for... Mr. Kern, could you provide us with the number of meetings that Mr. White has missed in the last two years? Because I've lost count. You don't have to do it right now, but if you could let us know, yes. I'd appreciate it. Yes, I did have that. I don't have a handy on me right now. So. I think last time it was, he was, what, 10 out of 19? This would put him 11 out of 21, I believe. It was about half. I'll bring that back to the next board meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else, Mr. Kern? Nope. I do think the bond refinancing timing was probably hit the bottom of rates, which is great. Yes. We wanted. Yes. Mr. Sprague probably hit on where you got in just in the right amount of time. So. Okay. That's great. Okay. Uh, public participation session number one for general comments. Do we have any? There is none. All right. We will roll into the discussion items. First up is the uh, 2015 A and B refunding bond sale. Brad Sprague from Prison Municipal Advisors. Please come to the podium. Welcome. Well, thank you for having me to discuss the bond sale. But be before we begin, I need the phone number of those kids that were here earlier. I've got, I've got some lunch I need later. <laughs> and I'd like a meatball sandwich, too. So, uh, great kids. Um, we just completed uh, and closed on Tuesday of this week a refinancing for the Olentangy schools on several issues of outstanding bonds that were issued in 2006 and 2008. The total amount of the sale was $128.5 million. Um, we did two series, two different series of bonds. One was done on an actual taxable basis, which is very unusual for the school district, and, and that was $78 million of the total. Uh, the balance, roughly $50 million, was done on a tax-exempt basis. And the reason that we had to sell taxable bonds, unlike our normal tax-exempt model, is that the federal government and their infinite wisdom has determined that any bond issue can only be what's called advanced refunded, refinanced, one time during its life. And portions of the 2006 bonds were refunding bonds themselves. And so we were not eligible to do another tax-exempt financing. But rates have dropped so much since 2006 that we still saved considerable dollars by refinancing the bonds, even without the benefit of tax exemption. Uh, the policy that the district has followed in looking at refundings in the past is that they want to save at least 5% of the debt service um, in order to warrant it using that one opportunity to refund their bonds. And this sale comfortably met that threshold. 
Uh, the taxable bonds, we saved 6.6%. Uh, but more important than the percent is we saved $6.4 million on those bonds. On the tax-exempt bonds, we saved just over 7.9%. Uh, and it was a smaller issue, but we still saved $5.6 million on that series of bonds, or $12 million over the remaining life of the, of the two series of bonds. Uh, in my opinion, it's an extraordinary result. I'd like to say that it's all due to skill, but part of it was due to our timing, and part of our timing was very fortunate. We were very, very close to being at the absolute bottom of the market. We might have missed it by two weeks. Mm -hmm. um, but nevertheless, rates have done nothing but go up since the day of our sale. Um, that's average savings per year for the rest of the life of those bond issues of over $550,000. And so it's a meaningful number. Uh, Fifth Third Securities was the, the manager, the lead manager on the selling of the bonds. Um, the sale itself was, was a little touch and go, to be honest, because Brian and I pushed them pretty hard on the rates that we wanted to see. And they did not uh, sell any of the, many of the bonds until really the last 10 to 15 minutes of the sale when State Farm Insurance stepped up with an order of $72 million. So that certainly made the deal fly. Um, they were the biggest buyer of your bonds. Travelers Insurance was also a significant buyer. And interestingly enough, on the taxable sale, $13 million was sold to the city of Cincinnati. Um, as part of their investment portfolio. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the rating process. Um, the district is, as you know, very, very highly rated. Uh, AA1 by Moody's, which is the highest rating in the AA category, and AA plus by Standard & Poor's, which is the highest portion of their AA category. I felt strongly that things were lined up for us to get AAA by at least one of the two, and un unfortunately, we didn't, we didn't get it. Um, the district is set for an upgrade in the not too distant future. The demographics have always been strong. Um, your success at the ballot for close to 15 years has been untarnished, and that's pretty extraordinary when over the last decade you've been to the ballot numerous times. Um, They've always commented on the strong financial management within the district. And, um, and, your, and your, finally, your ability to stretch out the levy cycle. When you've gone to the voters, you've promised them three years, and you've delivered far in excess of that. The thing that was always the thing that got in our way of going to the next step was, it's undeniable, the district has a large amount of debt outstanding. And that's because over the last 20 years, went through a cycle where we were building a school a year. And the one thing that we stress to the rating agencies, and they've, we didn't have to stress it too hard, they've seen it, is that building phase is beginning to come down. In fact, you've got $20 million of bonding authority that was approved by the voters several years ago that hasn't been used. And my understanding is there's no expectation of using it in the, in the near future. So we thought with the, with the diminishing amount of bonds that we're issuing and expect to issue going out into the future, uh, that that was going to be what put us over the top. Uh, the Moody's analyst told us that it was discussed at length in the rating committee meeting. I certainly got the impression he was advocating for us in that committee um, and came up short. Uh, Standard & Poor's wasn't quite as enthusiastic, uh, I don't think, with their support of moving us to AAA. Their analyst just didn't seem to to understand that the building wasn't going to continue for the next 10 to 15 years. After one, two, or maybe three phone calls, Dr. Lucas, uh, we still never got it through. Something like that. Um, so that, that's pretty much how it went. I was very pleased with it. Um, and the other thing, away from the bond issue, but looking at your debt in general, is we, we've maintained a millage model for the district for, for many years now. and. When you went to the voters the last time with the voter bond issue, you promised the voters um, that the bond millage wouldn't be going up past 8.72 mills, period. 
and it's unlimited taxes you're putting on the ballot with a bond issue, but the pledge of the campaign was at 8.72 mils was the top. It began to look a couple of years ago when assessed valuation dropped for the first time in the district's history that that was going to be a challenge to adhere to that promise. Um, that's begun to turn. And uh, uh, in order to keep that pledge, the district's been drawing down on its bond retirement fund balance over the last several years. Fortunately, it had the foresight to build that bond retirement balance when times were good. It appears that this year will be the last time that we have to draw down on that balance. And we'll still have over $4 million in the bond retirement fund at the end of this year. That's a little low for a district with this much debt outstanding. We'd like to see that bond retirement fund balance built back up to uh, perhaps $12 million, which is about 50% of your annual debt service payments. That would be a good, healthy balance and one I think that your county auditor is comfortable with you building. So there doesn't seem to be much doubt that you're going to be able to adhere to the pledge. And it also looks like, barring any additional debt being issued, that you begin to lower that bond millage if you choose to do so beginning in 2018. And, um, and certainly down the road, when we get to the end of this five-year cycle, there's going to be room to do additional bonds and once again offer up the pledge of we're not going to go above 8.7 mils. So the plan has worked. Thank God we had built up the balance to a level where we could draw upon it the last few years, but that's why we did it. And um, sitting very well right now. And with that, I'll take any questions you might have. Um, I guess relative to like the double A, triple A discussions, is, is there much frankly value in the marketplace between the issue at a double A and the issue at a triple A in terms of the rate you're going to have to pay? It's it's not a constant. It changes over time. Yeah. And rates are so low now that everything sort of gets squished together. Yeah. Uh, maybe a tenth of a percent. So uh, it's not really an economic issue, more of a head, uh, prestige issue. issue. It's a prestige issue, right? Oh, there's yeah. definitely a prestige aspect of it. Yeah. And I can also tell you that of the, of the very few districts that are AAA in the state, I think there's only five or six, none of them have been through a, a growth spurt mm. like Olin Tangy or had to deal with, over the last 10 years, the magnitude of the building project you've dealt with. Um, they're districts that were a little ahead of you in, to, in terms of their growth spurt. So like most things, when do you get the good rating? When you don't need it anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, I do think that the, car, the table is set for the move in that direction. Okay, great. Anything else, Mr. Spray? No, very thorough. No. No. Appreciate the Thank, Thank you. you. Well done. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, next is our uh, academic update on uh, academic interventions. Mr. Rafe and Mr. Fetty. Ready? Yeah. <laughs> Since he has all the information, <laughs> did so well I didn't even make the title slide. <laughs> <laughs> Just doing introductions so tonight? Yeah, That's are. right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for having us again. Um, I do want to uh, reiterate what Dr. Lucas said. Um, this is the third time we've done this presentation uh, regarding our academic uh, interventions and our progress on, on our CIP goals. Uh, actually, Mr. O'Brien, you had asked the question uh, quite a few years ago regarding this. Uh, how do we know we're making progress on our CIP goals and what specific steps are we taking uh, to, to make progress on those goals? So uh, Jack's put together a presentation here that highlights uh, some of the specific steps, steps that our staff uh, does uh, along the way and um, to, to give you an update on where we are with uh, our interventions with our students. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Fetty. Thank you. Good evening. So I've selected five topics that I think are most appropriate to discuss with you this evening uh, related to academic interventions. There are a lot more topics that we could add to this discussion. Uh, because interventions like these happen on a daily basis in a number of different ways in all of our schools. Uh, but watch lists, response to intervention, the third grade guarantee, uh, college and career readiness and college remediation 
are all um, topics that we've discussed or I've discussed with you over the past uh, year or more. Um, so I think an update of those is appropriate. First, our watch lists, uh, which uh, refers specifically to, specifically to CIP benchmark one of meeting or exceeding projections. Um, given all the discussion about uh, state testing recently, uh, I think it's good to remind everyone that we do use test data to uh, direct some teaching. Um, it's kind of a small nuance, but you know, our teachers, we, we really stress that we're not about preparing kids to pass a test. We're about preparing kids and then using test information to prepare them further. Um, it's a small distinction. Um, but we, we do care about how students perform on tests. We're, we're uh, sensitive to over-testing as well, but some testing is, is certainly important. Uh, again, CIP Benchmark 1 is focused on uh, projections. We use a statistical model to take prior test scores of students, compare those to prior groups of other students who are similar in terms of their testing records, and uh, generate projections for each of those students uh, at one of five levels, advanced through limited. Um, so that when we start the year, we have an idea of how a student has performed in the past and how, that, how likely they are to perform this year. And when students aren't meeting um, proficient, we have a, we, those students are on a watch list and they have a plan. When students are supposed to be advanced but they're not performing at that level, we have a plan for those students as well everywhere in between. Um, so it's not just about getting students to the minimum proficiency, but about getting students to their maximum um, outcome on an assessment or in the class. And it's in our, actually, it's very interesting, Dr. Way, our statistician, uh, calculates um, projected performance index for each of our buildings, each of our grade levels across, you know, across the district. And it's uh, astonishing how accurate he, he is, his statistical model that he's developed. It really helps us um, put a, a clear target right out there for, for our building principals to, to push their staff towards. This year, uh, with the new tests, um, We've always been, we've been very confident in his statistical model in the past, and he's been, like I said, amazingly accurate. Uh, but because the tests are so new this year, we're not quite certain what we're projecting to, the performance mm -hmm. levels, and performance levels are different. So um, it's a whole new ball game this year with the new testing. Yeah, and along those lines, how will your interventions change? Because you're gonna have a delay mm -hmm. in, yeah. in the test outcomes. Yeah, the state released some information this week on when we'll be getting some of that, and it starts to some of the results from this year's mm -hmm. assessments, and they alluded to fall. Um, we've heard as early as, or as late as January of 16. Um, we're hoping that we might get some early preliminary results earlier in the fall, um, but this will certainly impact benchmark one as we move forward because uh, we might not be able to generate those uh, watch lists, but Dr. Way is looking at some other data that we might be able to use in terms of um, other internal tests that are given, uh, like the Terra Nova, mm -hmm. and the, uh, in a couple slides I'll talk about response to intervention. At least at K through 3 we'll have a, uh, or K through 2 this year, we'll have a measure that we can use as well, um, but it does mm -hmm. provide an obstacle, pre present an obstacle. Um, and then also we, we do budget, my department budgets specific funds for interventions in buildings depending on how many students um, are performing at different levels, get different uh, intervention funds from us to develop a building specific plan of intervention um, using the resources that are most appropriate at each building. Um, you see performances like tonight or, or presentations like tonight of our different schools and, and each of our schools have unique talents and amongst their staff, their students. Um, their parents. Uh, so having building level intervention plans we find is the, absolutely the most um, effective in this, in this regard. Response to intervention. Um, we completed an RTI audit in 2013 and that resulted in a four-year comprehensive uh, plan to fully implement an RTI model district-wide. Um, and I believe Chris Andres has talked to you a little bit about that in the past. Um, but AIMS-Web as a universal screener, it's a computer-based test. It's a couple minutes uh, in length, um, but it's statistically rely reliable and valid. Um, and it's used uh, to help us identify students with specific needs in reading and soon in math as well. Um, and as a result of that, students are then placed in a Tier 1, Tier 2, or Tier 3 intervention system, which is uh, 
there are interventions that can take place in the classroom prior to any referral for special education down the road. This isn't about uh, special education. This is about uh, uh, interventions within the classroom for all students. So anytime a student might be falling behind in a certain area even, um, RTI is designed to help identify those needs and bring them to uh, teachers' attention faster um, than waiting for an end-of-year test. And our rollout plan, we, we've, we're into uh, K2 this year. Uh, using these assessments next year will be three through five, and the following year, six through eight. And RTI is happening at the high school as well, um, but we're not certain that um, Ames Web will be at that level full scale yet, so I didn't include it on the slide. Third grade guarantee, you'll remember last year was our first year in third grade guarantee. Um, none of the law has really changed this year, so all of our K-3 uh, teachers are placing students when needed on a reading improvement monitoring plan, which is a requirement of the law. Um, another noteworthy third grade guarantee point is that third grade reading students are not exempt from any ramifications of state testing this year. Uh, we're familiar with House Bill 7 and, and kind of the news has said that students won't be held accountable for test results this year. Um, that is not true for third grade students in terms of reading. Um, they're still taking the old test, the OAA, and um, they need to reach a minimum score here this spring in order to be promoted to the fourth grade per the state law. You'll remember last year, um, in, you might not remember this, but we had 152 students in the fall. Um, across all of our third grades who were potentially going to be impacted by the third grade guarantee. Again, they take a test in the fall that measures end of year expectations. So end of, so before they get third grade instruction, how are they supposed to, there's a minimum proficiency set. We had 152 students last year. By the summer, we had zero. That means everyone matriculated to fourth grade. This year, that number is 157. Um, that, you know, considering um, everything we know, that's a perfectly, uh, expected number for that so uh, we'll be looking forward to hopefully having that number at zero again but each of those 157 students has a reading improvement and monitoring plan that was created by their teacher principal and their parent um, that identifies specifically where the student's struggling and what interventions that student will be receiving throughout the course of this year so that they won't be um, retained potentially by the law and does the um passing score of the third grade guarantee change every year? Yeah, it, it's uh, incrementally going up over the next couple of years. So it is, yeah, roughly two points, two more correct questions, more rigorous than last year's score. We have roughly 1,550 third graders, just in total, just as we're told. Yeah. Um, the next topic, college and career readiness, a major focus around the state with our new standards. Uh, Dr. Lucas mentioned earlier uh, when Dr. Harrison was here from uh, Columbus State talking about the Central Ohio Compact and some concerted efforts that we have for college and career readiness as a region. Um, but within the district over the past couple of years, our professional development focus has been on things like instructional shifts and transfer. Those are buzzwords, but what they mean is how does instruction need to change in order to help students not just know things, but apply them to the appropriate setting, whether in college or career, to transfer the knowledge that they're learning in school and making it more useful for them. Um, we've had very good, we do staff feedback, staff surveys of our professional development. It's been very well received. Uh, we're also undertaking a massive curriculum blueprinting professional development opportunity for teachers. Um, Vince Dottilio and Anthony Elkins are leading that. and. We bring teachers in and what they're doing is really unpacking the standards and identifying what is it about their grade level and their content area that students really need to know before they move on and how are we going to know that they, that they have that basic knowledge and skills across all of our buildings. Uh, it's a very rewarding experience for the teachers that participate. And you know, just in line with that, you know, the comments about Common Core or Ohio's new learning standards and loss of local control that that whole process and we're really uh, excited about it and, and, and the quality of the work that uh, Jack's team and, and the teachers are doing um, is as is, is good of curriculum work as I've ever seen and it is a, a solid example of what local control is our our teachers are developing our curriculum and what they call cornerstone tests that each child 
well, the things that we want them to know and be able to do from grade level to grade level in all of the subject areas. So it's a, it is a really exciting uh, activity that they're performing. It's great work. And then, of course, college and career readiness is not just about professional development, but student programs as well. So we've talked about STEM and mentorship and teacher academy. You've had presentations on those things recently. We're all well aware of our advanced placement success as a district. Um, you'll be voting on College Credit Plus agreement tonight, but uh, College Credit Plus, the new dual enrollment, um, we continue to develop that program and it's growing. There's about 50 students participating this current school year and over 100 have signed up for next year, so it continues to grow. And uh, so does our partnership with the Delaware Area Career Center. Um, they're developing an engineering program. They're working closely with us as we're developing our STEM program so that they are um, cohesive and our students have an option there in terms of the Career Center if they were to choose that work readiness uh, track to graduation. And lastly, um, college remediation rates. We've, uh, uh, in my four years in the district, we've always had uh, discussions about these. Um, I'll remind you, um, OBR, our Board of Regents, uh, publishes remediation rates. We also, as a district, s subscribe to the National Student Clearinghouse, which, as you'll recall, tracks students not just in Ohio public colleges, but also Ohio private colleges, out-of-state public colleges, and out-of-state private colleges. Um, so I, I've put both data sets up here for you to compare by high school for the class of 2013, which is the most recent data. Um, so let's see if I, let's work through this. So Long Tangy High School, the Board of Regents says that 16% of the class of 2013 needed remediation when they went to college. Um, there were 174 students total in the Board of Regents sample. So out of 174 Long Tangy graduates who went to public college in Ohio, 16% of the 174 needed college remediation. When we look at the National Student Clearinghouse data, there were 256 graduates from Olentangy High School who went to college somewhere in a college within the National Student Clearinghouse um, database. There are some colleges that are not in the database, um, but when we, when we look at the student breakdown, it's a handful of uh, students at most in a given year. Um, and according to that data, 10.8% of that 256 needed college remediation. And in, in, in that remedi remediation rate, thanks, Mark, means in reading or math. The Board of Regents uh, publishes a English remediation rate, a math remediation rate, a English and math remediation rate, meaning students need a remediation in both. And this is reading or math. This is the most comprehensive. This would be the biggest number that we could report for remediation. All of those other three numbers would be smaller than this number. Um, so cards on the table. What are the ACTA? Um Benchmark scores, yeah. 18 in English and 22 in math. So you can see the other high schools uh, across there as well. And then when you look at us as a district over time, so in yellow at the top you have the state of Ohio's remediation rate for all um, students in Ohio. The remediation rate for the class of 2013 was 37%. That's OBR data. So again, the OBR data for Olentangy was 15% needed remediation. That included 538 of our students. When we look at the National Student Clearinghouse, it takes into account 840 students. Most of you were on the board, I believe, in 2013. I don't know exactly how many graduates we had in 2013, but it was around 1,000. 1100 so 840 of those students went to college in fall immediately following high school in a school within the national student uh, clearinghouse database 9.6 percent of them needed remediation and you'll see you see where that number has been over time lastly graduation rates um, another thing we can do now uh, for the first time with the national student clearinghouse um, again, I subscribed in my first year, so we're four years out now, so we've been in the pool for four years. So we've got our first data sample, which would be the class of 2009. Um, their four-year college graduation rate 
was 46.4%. So that's students who graduated from Olentangy local schools in 2009, who went to college immediately in the fall following their senior year, 46% graduated college uh, within four years. Similarly, the Ohio graduation rate in four years was 29%. Um, we also are able to now have a five-year graduation rate on that class. It goes up to 66%. Ohio only reports a four-year and a six-year graduation rate, but the six-year graduation rate for the class of 09 was 52% for the state of Ohio. So the fact that we're at 66, almost 67% at, at a five-year rate is um, dramatically better than the state average, of course. Um, and the, um, oh, go ahead, Kevin, I'm sorry. Just quick, so I understand the rates. So the five year, the 66.8 includes the 46.4? Correct. Okay. So an incremental 20% took the extra year. Mm -hmm. Okay. And right. is that of all colleges nationwide or just only in Ohio? That's nationwide. Anyone in, that's, this is from the, Ohio doesn't uh, provide this data for us. Okay. This is only from the National Student Clearinghouse. Uh, I was going to mention earlier the Ohio data is very close to the national data as well. It, it's a little higher than the national data, if anyone wondered. But all, all of that is good news in, in my world, but it's also stuff that we want to see continuing to improve as we get the data um, in future years. And I also want to point out that it's having the, this data as a way to look at college remediation in a more comprehensive way now. It's not just looking at how they do in the fall of their freshman year, but how do they do four years after and five years after leaving Olentangy. We'll have a six-year rate for the class of 2009. We should have a four-year rate for the class of 2010 um, by November of this year, if not earlier. Um, so I'll continue to report these to the board. We'll probably find a way at some point to work them into the annual report because um, I think it's data worth tracking. Any other questions? One, one quick one. Yep. So the, the five areas you pointed out, um, my question is, um, do you feel that the, the parents are obviously involved in, well, at least the first four mm -hmm. more intimately, but do you think that we're doing a good job of providing a clear understanding of these academic intervention processes to the parents? And, um, and what that means, and are they participating willingly, and is there anything else that we can do as a district to uh, educate them further so that we get more participation and support? Yeah, it's actually something we've been talking about recently is how can we make some of the intervention um, interventions that are available to students um, available to parents and help parents understand when they're appropriate. A lot of times a parent might say, I want my child to have this reading intervention program. Well, if that reading intervention program isn't targeted to meet your child's need, that's a waste of your child's time. But if, if a parent thinks that that's what they want, um, you know, it, that, that's just a, a further conversation. So what happens uh, typically when a student goes through um, IAT, which is a intervention assistance team at the building, which is kind of the entry into the RTI process. Uh, the school contacts the, the family, uh, ex invites them in for a meeting, explains what difficulties are, are out there, explains what resources are available in the building, and they talk through with the parents on an individual basis um, what the school can do for, for, uh, for that child. Where it becomes confusing is then when your next door neighbor hears that you were invited in for a meeting to get that specific intervention and, and you didn't get that call. So sometimes buildings will get a call to say, why aren't I on Lexia, which is a computer-based reading program. Um, and that's not a conversation that our teachers and our principals can't have. They do have those all the time. Um, but that's, it's tricky to explain the breadth of options that are available um, while saying, you, you can't possibly put every student into every option every day. Um, so. And, you know, we, simple answer to your, to your question is yes, we can always do a better job in every, in, in every aspect of communicating what, are, what options are available um, and, and what you could possibly take advantage of. I think that all starts with the teacher. The most effective academic intervention, the best way to prepare kids for future success is with that, the high quality teacher delivering our curriculum 
in, in, you know, the most effective manner. So the, the kids get the most success by having one of our great staff members. Um, and it's really, it's their responsibility to identify those um, and, and ask those questions. It's not always a, a, an easy conversation, though, when a kid is struggling mm -hmm. and, and you approach a parent and say, hey, here's where I see your child struggling. Um, and, and, but we have to be willing to have those conversations, our teachers and our principals and, and our parents. Um, and, and we also have to be receptive when a parent approaches us and says, hey, I don't think my child is performing at a level they're capable of performing at. Okay, what do we want to do? Because we always want to communicate that message about this is a partnership. We care about your, your child's success every bit as much as you do. So you know, what can we do to, to make it better? Um, but they are very personal conversations, especially when it's your child and your child's struggle. Right. You know, two of the things we've done this year that um, I think are really helping along those lines are the common uh, planning time for teachers at the elementary level, which allows teams of teachers to have uh, meetings with parents. So if, if we all see your child or, um, well, yeah, we, could, we can meet with you and, and have a conversation, but also allows the, the teachers to plan for the second thing is their intervention and enrichment time which is a, a chance for teachers to specifically design lessons to meet unique uh, needs of kids. And they can cross plan, they can share students. So while um, you might be a first grade teacher and I might be a first grade teacher, we can divide up our kids during that intervention and enrichment time and you can take you know, addition and I can take subtraction and if you're you know, the students who are struggling in those areas. Um, so we're really intentional about recreating the elementary schedule to allow for those things. A byproduct of that is hopefully that teachers are able to communicate more frequently and more accurately about um, what's happening with their students during the school day uh, in those intervention enrichment times. So uh, parents should be more aware, hopefully. But and it's really the same. It's a, it's essentially the same process that's happening for a student who needs an intervention. It's about getting them to perform at or above their current state. But for a student who needs enrichment, it's a, it's the, uh, the conversation about a gifted child who needs to be challenged at an even higher level um, and getting them to perform to the highest level possible. And those are the drivers that, that move our our academic indicators. Absolutely. But you know, it, it really does all just, it all filter, filters back to our district mission. So we're going to facilitate maximum learning for every student. We have to meet every one of their needs. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else for Mr. Betty? Thanks. Thank you, John. Next up is the uh, human resource discussion item, Mr. Marsh. These were the uh, retire, rehire discussions that Mr. Lucas, Dr. Lucas, referenced in his report. Dr. Mr. Good evening. Uh, today on the uh, board agenda under discussion items, there are uh, three items, uh, one administrator and two teachers that um, were asking uh, or to have a discussion about the potential of allowing them to uh, retire and be rehired in the district in the same position. Um, for the board, uh, for the district to execute this process, there's three basic steps that have to take place to be in compliance with Ohio Revised Code. The first step is to give a media notice of the intent for us to have this discussion that we're having tonight, and that, and that notice has went out. Um, tonight uh, is the, first, the second step to have a discussion answer any question anyone may have and certainly give the, the public an opportunity to comment should they choose to and then uh, we'll be back at the April 9th board meeting to ask for your approval uh, for their uh, rehire. On the board agenda tonight we have Cindy DeAngelis who is currently the principal of Johnny Cake uh, Elementary and has done an outstanding job and had outstanding results uh, in her time with the district. Um, and we're asking to the board to consider rehiring her after she retires at the end of this year. Sue Andrews has been a, a teacher in Olentangy for, for uh, a number of years, done an outstanding job uh, building her program, um, and we're going to ask uh, the board to consider uh, her to be rehired to help uh, build the program at the Olentangy Academy uh, with the mentorship program. Uh, David Ratchke at Liberty High School, um, Again, sort of a byproduct of the creation of the OLTNG Academy, Ed Miley is a teacher at Liberty High School, also industrial technology that would be going over, moving over to the OLTNG Academy next year. And by retaining uh, Mr. Retschke, uh, that will allow us to, to fill the need that, that they're at Liberty High School. 
also as a piece of information that sometimes comes up when we talk about retiree hires. This is certainly something that we do very carefully. Um, and it certainly is something we do not do with a large number of teachers. We have 1,179 teacher FTEs in the district. And if these rehires are approved, ultimately, that will give us just six of 1,179 teachers that are retire rehires. So a very, very small percentage of folks it's folk, are folks that we deem to be outstanding and really fills a need that we have. And then just one administrator, which would be Cindy. Um, the total savings uh, to the district for these th three individuals would be uh, around $87,000. Um, for the total group of retired rehires, because we have several that will be continuing in that role next year, the six teachers and one administrators, just under $210,000 for next year. Certainly would entertain any questions if you have them. Mr. King? I just have a comment, if I may. Uh, I'd like to make reference to uh, Mr. Rathje. I'm very pleased to see his name on the list. Uh, with personal experience, oh, a few years ago, when back in the day of the Liberty Marching Band and drum lines when the parents were all out in the hallways building props for their performances and competitions. He opened up the shop and let us work in his space, let us use the tools, and I think we did a pretty good job of cleaning up. We tried our best. And, and, and that was just a wonderful uh, uh, opportunity he provided us. It made our work so much more efficient. So it's just this is just, a, I'm pleased to see this. He obviously represents what the old Tangi uh, teachers are all about, and uh, so I'm very pleased to see his name included here. Julie? Yes. Um, Mr. Martian mentioned the savings. Um, I just want to reiterate for the media that's here, these people don't have to retire. They could continue on at their current salary, and then we don't recoup those savings. So I, I just want to make that clear. And then, Mr. Marsh, could you, or it might be a question for Mr. Kern, could you tell us what percentage these teachers and administrators have been paying into their retirement? Because a lot of times people get confused and they think, well, we're double paying them. But they have made contributions toward their retirement too. And I understand that that has increased, I believe, as of this year, it went up, up to 12 percent now. And what was it previously? 10. 10. So they've been paying into the retirement too, which they will collect up upon this retire rehire. So I don't want people to think that they, a lot of times they call it double dipping, when that's not really the case. Uh, the one one last point, unlike other school districts in Central Ohio who do retire rehire and they rehire at the same salary level, we do not. And that's the savings that Mr. Marsh spoke of. So we get to keep the experience and save money on the other side. Absolutely. Okay. And that's the case both with the teachers uh, and the administrator. I should mention there's one more retire rehire that we're considering. I, I got a call with the building principal, but I would bring that to you at a later time because uh, each one of these would have to go through a very specific timeline to comply with the higher advice code. So if that um, comes to fruition, I'll be back. With okay. Just one more. Right. Anything else, Mr. Marsh? No? Thank you. All right. Thank you. Very good. Uh, public participation session number two regarding action items. No comments? Okay. Mr. Curran, you want to present the treasurer action items? Yes. Uh, as mentioned in the treasurer's report on uh, this evening's agenda for treasurer action items, uh, A, improvements for February 18th, uh, B, approve amended FY15 appropriations at the fund level, and C, approve donations to the district. Okay. Do you have a motion? Uh, a motion to approve. A second. second. Any discussion? Yeah. Thank the uh, donors for the generous gifts. Ms. Caldwell? Mr. Bartz? Yes. Mr. King? Yes. Mrs. Fiesel? Yes. Mr. O'Brien? Yes. Dr. Lucas, here to present the uh, superintendent action items. As to present superintendent action items A through G as amended, please. So moved. Seconded. Any discussion? Anyone pull any items? Hold on one sec. Yeah, sorry. All right. Good. Please call the roll. 
Mrs. Fiesel? Yes. Mr. Bartz? Yes. Mr. King? Yes. Mr. O'Brien? Yes. I will now entertain a motion to adjourn. Can I motion, please? Move. Second. Second. Any discussion? Okay, please come roll. Mr. King? Yes. Mr. Bartz? Yes. Mrs. Fiesel? Yes. Mr. O'Brien? Yes. So that concludes uh, tonight's meeting. Thank you for coming. Uh, next meeting again is the special meeting on uh, March 25th here at uh, 6 o'clock for just one action item. It's going to be to interview and select uh, search firms. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming.